Namaste and in La Catch, and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and this week's guest is Gregory Stern. Now, Greg's had a very interesting development from a teenager when he suffered a physical injury that then led him to both di discovering how to heal his body and took him on an inner quest as well. So we're going to find out more about that. Greg, uh, I want to say, is also the founder and owner of From the Ground Up Physi Physiotherapy. Uh, he had started on thinking that he wanted to become a doctor and then found out rapidly that it was more important to learn about the body and being able to heal it. And Greg, I really appreciate your time and thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, good. Uh, I hope that I served you well in that brief introduction that you've really done a lot of development for such a young age, I must say. So what was it like? You know, most of our guests... Uh, matter of fact, all of our guests have had some kind of inner development and, and been able to navigate the bridging of their inner experience and the, their outer experience in the world. So what was it like for you when, when you were, did you have any inklings about that before your injury? Was there some um, initial development of, of um, an inner understanding or a connection that maybe you didn't quite understand, but it was obvious was there? Well, I think everything was revealed more after the fact, to be honest. Um, probably at the time, you know, when I, when I hurt myself at the age of 19, I just had an innocent ankle sprain that just never healed properly. Um, prior to that experience, I was a very wild, rambunctious teenager and, and kid getting hurt, breaking bones. I got two front teeth stuck in my head at one time. I had lacerations everywhere. I was always getting into trouble. I'm a um, curious kid that liked to explore and doing stuff, right? Exactly. I mean, was yeah, it the yeah. adrenaline rush that you were after at the time? Honestly, no. It was just like silly things my parents would be walking in the street and like where's greg where's greg and they turn around and i'd be like climbed up the tree i was like hi you know yeah yeah uh, yeah, up, yeah up in the tree those are fun so, times and good for you for being that curious too yeah, yeah yeah um but then when i had hurt myself at that moment in time i was in a period where i was with in a relationship that was probably not optimal for me but i needed to figure that out on my own and my parents like not feeling that it was the best for me and trying to learn my lessons for me. Right. And so, as we do as parents. Yeah, I think so. But, you know, you know, as I've come to learn a lot about parenting and not yet even being a parent, but going through the process of therapy and understand like, you know, childhood programs and where things come from, like understand like, I think really the most important things we, as you're use the word facilitate, you know, facilitate experiences, but not, force or guide or impose our views we could share them in a way but not necessarily like, i know what's best for you and therefore i'm going to lay out a predetermined path for you and that's kind of how i felt like my life was a little bit when i was sure. you know parents that are very well intentioned but at the same time um yeah everything they're doing is out of love but their version absolutely of we want to yeah. keep our children you know i'm i'm a father grandfather even a great grandfather now and as a father, you know, you want to just protect your children. You want to keep them safe. You want to provide experiences for them to grow. Yeah. And oftentimes we think, oh, because we've been down this path before, we know better. Mm. And so we try to impart that wisdom, which, as you know, especially as teenagers, unless you're asking questions, what we're trying to tell you doesn't land. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I was, you know, I was caught in, in a space where I was getting tugged from one way by my ex-girlfriend, tugged by my parents in this way. And I was back and forth, back and forth in the middle. And then boom, my ankle sprain goes. And, you know, the way that I've looked back, back at things is like in, in the, the realm of therapy that I've in, that dove into, like injuries have significance. And so an ankle is actually a change of direction conflict. So well, that's we, interesting. Uh, how how did that come about? What's because uh, it makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. And I know in Chinese medicine, there are so many things that are interrelated, such as that. Could you explain a little bit more? Yeah. Well, again, I I didn't know any of this at the time. It's more looking back and working with a very interesting therapist that where, um, I'll do my best to try explain how um 
basically the way that these French, uh, so I'm from Montreal and, and the therapist I work with, he like has studied under some guys. I think the guy's name is Bricot and they've mapped out the body in very interesting different ways from an emotional standpoint where like different body parts mean different things. So they, mm. they've looked at like a lot of, you know, it's the same way with like different diagnoses. Now we're starting to understand that. Okay. Like someone, you start to see people that have ALS, for example, they're all people pleasers. So they do like personality assessments of different people with, let's say, a certain type of breast cancer and like ask about their personalities. And, you know, I don't know if you heard of Gabor Mate before, you know, the trauma psychologist, uh, mm -hmm. trauma specialist. And he he's determined that a lot of types of diagnosis, often people are holding certain personality traits. So we could actually look at that in body parts as well. So with like someone who's like always spraining an ankle, um, that might mean something, someone who hurts their knee. And so um, I could explain how that came about, but ultimately- sure. I mean, uh, I'm sure that would be quite lengthy, but however, in how you're explaining it, knowing what I do about uh, Chinese medicine and meridians and, and marmas and chakras and all those yeah. kinds of things, it would just, stand to reason we we have a holistic system with many yeah. integrated yes um very you know um, intricate parts that we don't understand because we don't take the time to ask our bodies what's going on right first of all and yet there's this curiosity to understand yeah that, you know especially when you've had something and, and these other uh, therapists that you're talking about and, and researchers that there's got to make, you know, sense has to be there somewhere. How do we make that? What kind of questions do we ask? And the very interesting thing is we actually can ask the question. So there's something called integrated kinesiology, which is basically just using an indicator muscle mm -hmm. to ask the body a question. So for example, let's say I wanted to know if I was intolerant to certain food. Um, what I could do is put that food on my body and then put my arm out. And someone who knows how to do this test, so just test the strength of your arm. Let's say I put my arm out and he tests my arm as like, oh, super strong. And then I don't even know what he's putting on me. And then the next one, he'll like put something else on me and then he'll test me. And my arm, like no matter how, how hard I push, it just mm -hmm. goes. And like, then he'll open up his hand. It could be like GMO corn or something. It's like, I had no idea, but it's just this idea of like, we, we can look and test. Everything's energy, up. right? Yeah, exactly. So it's like a. It's a, if your body, if your nervous system or your entire being feels like threatened temporarily, it's like your body will just shut off. So the very interesting thing is now we can start asking other, any type of question we want. So I've got a pain in my ankle, for example. Okay. Let's look at it and see, like test out mom. No. Sure. Dad. Now you brought oh. that back to, to the ankle. Let, let's go back there again. Yeah, ex up where yeah, so, you first began that. Yeah. So essentially we could like test out body pains in a like almost an emotional sense, like what energy is stored in that area of the body. So for mm -hmm. example, it's very obvious to say, imagine you have a big scar on your body. Every time you look at that scar, there's like an emotional charge to that event. So, like immediately, oh, so what happened? You start describing it. You start telling about like the emotions that were associated with that event. So for example, like I, I did this to a client of mine and she had a big scar in her neck. And this is when I was just learning about all this stuff. So I was just like, all right, let's test out this person. And so I test out fear, anger, anxiety, loss, mourning, broken heart. Boom, her arm just goes weak. And so I just asked the question, is like, is this scar at all associated with a broken heart for you? And immediately on a dime, tears start strolling down her face. And she says, when I was in the hospital getting surgery on my, on my neck, my mother died in the hospital. Like, and I didn't, didn't get to say goodbye to her. I mm -hmm. had no idea, obviously. Like, um, but so, right? Scars hold emotion in them, but so do other pains in our body. So do diseases or whatever. It's right. Like the body is so charged, it has to put it somewhere. And so, poof, like in, in the case of what happened with me, like looking back and understanding, I was in such a place where like everyone was pulling me in every different direction, girlfriend, and then my parents. But like, I never stopped to ask myself the question, like, what do I want? What right. do we all need? That's right. the all-important question, isn't it? Very important, but we weird. don't ask that question. You yeah. know, it's so it, crazy. Is it any wonder that we've ended up in such a codependent society? Yeah. 
Yeah. So essentially like at that moment in time, like, like that started a journey for me where like I was dealing with chronic issues in my foot for two and a half years. I was going and seeing everyone under the sun, physios, osteos, chiros, trying every different methodology and nothing really was working. And like at the time I was thinking about applying to medicine, as you mentioned in the introduction, and I've always been fascinated by the human body, but like, I didn't care about anything at that point, except healing my own issues because I was dealing with chronic pain 24 seven. I hurt myself at 19. Yeah. You want to take care of you first. I mean, yeah, exactly. you can't do anything for anybody else until like, you're uh, yeah, cold, right? exactly. So I was dealing with this pain. I just like, I became pretty depressed because like I couldn't do the things I loved anymore. And so I started like trying to figure out a solution to my own problem because eventually I got surgery and the surgery only led to more problems in my body, I started getting hip pain and back pain. And it was really only till I start to take a deep dive and start to learn from like people outside the confines of traditional like physical therapy, mm -hmm. did I start to make progress on myself. So I wasn't like, I, I went to school to physical therapy um, after deciding against medicine. Thankfully I was rejected to be honest. Cause I, you know, that's not what my calling was. Um, and eventually starting to learn from different people outside, uh, like, you know, lots of continued education, I started to make very interesting progress on myself um, to the point where like, I couldn't stand barefoot for more than 10 seconds without pain. And now like I go on hikes barefoot. Um, I, I do slack lining. I, you know, I walk between trees and stuff and do lots of very cool things to my body, but it only came from a place where like, I, I had to, really reject what was being given to me because I was trying it on myself and it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that was kind of the, the long and short of a long history of pain for six years. Wow. That, that's going to be excruciating. I know my father had rheumatoid arthritis and ended up having to retire because he couldn't use his hands and he was yeah. a tool and die maker. Yeah. Right? yeah. So that had to have been, you know, not only physically excruciating, but emotionally too, because he loved what he was doing. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's interesting how you, you know, express that there's this, you got your desire of healing yourself first and, and becoming whole. And, and oftentimes this self love is misinterpreted as being a somewhat egocentric, especially when you're talking with others and things like that. And it's really not that at all. You know, there's this intense, your body's telling you something, right? So you pay attention to it. What does it mean? Where does it come from? What's the history of it? Uh, how can I alleviate it? What changes do I need to make in my own life in order to do so? All of those kinds of questions that is what I heard from what you just said, right? Yeah. And those things then take you into a path, if you will, of not just learning about your body, but it's also an inner development process. So as you were doing that on the inner development side and, and acknowledging your own thinking and being and, and how the world is responding to you, what did you notice in as, as you were going through the process of learning about yourself and growing into that place where you're fully healthy again? Um, you know, one of the, I guess the first things that came up, so I saw this therapist who does all sorts of testing. You mentioned the word chakras, right? So like he'll literally put his hand over different chakras and then test your arm. And so like it, it prompts extremely interesting conversations. And the first thing that happened on this session, number one, and now I've seen this guy 60 times or whatever. I saw him yesterday. I like been seeing him for the last three years and he's just like become a very close confidant of mine. And he's absolutely changed my entire life and the relationships with the people around me. And so it's been a, you know, absolutely game changer. Mm -hmm. But the first thing I think it was like, it puts his hand over my, you know, third eye and he's like, arm weak. You don't have confidence in yourself. It's like, that doesn't seem like me. And then it was like, your father doesn't have inner confidence in you. And so that was like the big thing is like really starting to recognize and separate myself from this enmeshment of, you know, me and my parents and learning that like, I don't need anyone's approval for the way I want to conduct my life. 
Um, and that was like the biggest revelation to start off with. Like, you know, everything like you, you want to like survivor mo survival mode of a child is like needing the parents to take care. But as we get older, you know, we're often externalizing our own journeys based off how other people view us. And so until you start realizing that, like, if you're always chasing that external validation from others, then you're never really going to be satisfied and content in your own life. Mm -hmm. So that was like the biggest thing for me is really just start to develop my own inner confidence and self and realize like, you know, funny enough, like, so my father's a physician and my mom's a, a physiotherapist, but <laughs> well, being a physiotherapist. so here's now that you've revealed that here's an interesting point. Cause I was just thinking about uh, James Redfield and the Celestine prophecy, right? One of the things I don't know if you've ever read it or not, but it talks about how we grow up and that we often will do both of our parental assignments, right? Their, their lives, right? We try to emulate their ways of being and their professions until we find our own way. So it's interesting that, you know, you had this choice of, of both in, you went with the, the physiotherapy. Yeah. I, uh, I, I can relate to it from my own personal thing. Dad was a machinist and, and I started uh, my professional career as a machinist. And I also, my mother was a teacher and she wanted a, a preacher or a teacher and ended up getting both. So I combined those two <laughs> along the way and then found my own way, um, which is what we really all need to do. What you said about needing approval you know, the, these are the things that get in the way, safety, approval, acceptance, mm -hmm. right? those are all self-related. And we often make it other related because we want to be, we want to have friends who want to be loved. And, you know, so we do all these things that seem to be adversely affecting our lives ultimately because we're just not happy. Yeah living other people's lives so how did you move through that in your the physiological or physiotherapy development and that co-mingling of your own personal development i i mean i obviously everything was a journey and it was slow and um i think the more I saw results on myself, the more I kept going down more rabbit holes because I was just obviously at that point chasing like uh, a sense of peace within my body because of how much pain I was constantly in. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really often going against the grain of like, you know, what modern medicine tells us, what modern physiotherapy. So like I practice in a very different manner because everything – like, you know, when we, when we go, I love the word alternative is used in very funny ways. Oh, it's alternative. Yeah, but it's not pharmacologically oriented. Exactly. Then it's alternative, right? right. And so, you know, the problem as we were talking about is like, okay, we, we have to learn to listen. But when we live in a world of Advil and Tylenol being pushed around the corner, right? Like those pain as a signal is very important to listen to rather than killing pain we need to listen to it and mm -hmm. and be guided by that pain so i i was you know letting that be you my seem to be smiling I, I pardon the interruption but it, it makes so much sense that um you know the pain and suffering is optional right and that with this uh distraction of avoiding the pain right we don't listen and so we continue those processes and patterns that just reinforce the stinking thinking that we already have. How did you realize that that stinking thinking gave you the opportunity to question the reality that you were experiencing? Because the stinking thinking is pretty much based on past programming, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I really think awareness is so key you know because we're all living in a very like unconscious like de like non-deliberate way where it's just like the automated programs running the background and i mean i really think a huge part of it was having a guide and i think like having someone to speak to that like helped me reframe and like bring this language into my my body and into my mm -hmm. vernacular and just of just general life and 
but just like as I mentioned, like going against the grain is just like understanding that like obviously pain is super multifactorial. And it has to do with the way that we sleep, the way that we eat, the way that we, you know, think about pain. Like mindset is a huge thing as well as just like overall, the overall approach of like even the physical therapy realm is just like lie on a table and get massaged or manipulated and expect for like miracles to happen the moment you stand up. So like knowing that how could I as a physiotherapy student at the time, like Everyone is just listening to the teacher and I'm questioning the teacher and it's like 0.1% of people are doing things differently. And that's usually who changes society is the 0.1% that are always like challenging, you know, the courage. Push the society. envelope. Yeah, pushing the envelope. And so when I started to like ask questions and realize. I mean, it's more opening the envelope. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, what, you know, when my teachers couldn't answer me, like, yeah, just kind of like keep quiet or whatever. Like, like this is how we do things. I'm like, uh, like. I knew ultimately it was like, all right, like just get a paper that has like, okay, now I have a physiotherapy degree and now I can write insurance receipts or whatever. But like, I knew that I'd have to practice in a different manner, but that also like didn't just apply to physiotherapy itself and the way I was going to help myself and help others, but also just like in general, like seeing that like most people are walking around as like babies and adult bodies. And so, and like they're just reactive and like the, the feedback loops on being able to see something that was said about them and react in a way that's just defending their ego versus like hmm i never thought about it that way like most people don't say that like they they, they just go immediately to defensive mode do you find that and i'm i would guess that the questions that you asked of your teacher were welcomed However, it seems that most of the time when we're asked questions or questions are asked of others, it's seen as a confrontation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Why do you think that is? Because people are extremely agreeable and don't want to uh, ruffle the feathers and like want to be accepted. And you know, it's like my wife sometimes is like, like she's extremely agreeable and like has lots of friends but like, I tend to be like more, cause again, like I, I think so much of our society is extremely dysfunctional and we've normalized dysfunction as what like exists all around us. Categorize, so, label, diagnose, treat, exactly. all, yeah, all that yeah, kind yeah. of stuff. Right. So why is it? Yeah. I, th I think it's just like, people don't want to ruffle the feathers. They're very agreeable. And if like, we could have healthy disagreement and not like i mean the whole buddha saying of like we are not our thoughts right but most mm -hmm. people when they are their their thoughts are infringed upon their entire core being is infringed upon right because you got seventy thousand thoughts a day or so they say exactly okay? yeah how many of those is result or self-deprecating because you're not happy with what's happening and and you're creating that negative attitude towards yourself now and in that the questions back to the questions right and you were responding as though the questions were being asked of you and you're okay with that because you like taking the deep dives what do you think others who uh, who are not necessarily offended but confronted by questions and having not necessarily thought about what the answers might be then seem to and, and i'm just posing this as a possibility i guess that their belief systems are confronted in in some way whether it's the core belief system or how they think people should behave right um what do you notice in, in questioning others that in your perspective of that deep dive into self how in physiotherapy it, it's probably a bit different in general so there's two questions i guess what's it like with the physiotherapy side of it because your questions are important and, and they're more open and vulnerable in that situation as compared to out the general public when you're asking others questions that they may not be too comfortable with yeah so let's start with gen pop like just general population like when we ask questions of other people i think it's just 
the concept is scary and frightening and holy shit if i actually have to like look at this question i have to question the way i've been thinking about something or my just like my internal whole being and that's too scary because that is the death of old self and therefore I don't want to change. And so that's why people stick with the familiar, even though it could be scary or outright okay, deadly. Everything. Yeah, very damaging, abusive, who, who knows? But it's just, I, I mean, because we don't encourage change. Like we want to just soothe rather than change, right? So it's like, mm -hmm. all right, you have a moment of discomfort, like, you know, grab the most immediate source of, like the way I see it now is that every single behavior that most like that everyone exhibits is it's to soothe the suffering, but suffering is necessary, right? We can't right. learn with well, suffering. It's almost a, they want to numb out rather than address the cause. Yeah. So whether it's like, you know, drugs, alcohol, gambling, uh, exercising, what, whatever it might be, every behavior ultimately like TV is just like, like, you know, I, I really do think that like life will throw at you the lessons that you need to learn and it will keep doing that over and over and over again until you learn that lesson. Yeah. But for some people, they literally will just like, you know, I heard this expression, maybe was it yesterday? Yeah, I think like the ostrich, I didn't even know this. The ostrich just puts his head in the sand, right? So I don't want to, I don't want to hear. And so, um, but I think it becomes super cool because when you, start to become attuned to the people that come into your life and like everything is an opportunity to learn from you start to realize that there's like almost this cosmic significance to like this event coming up and it's just like there's some relevance to your life so like injuries could be that instead of like you know i used to get hurt and because of that old place of suffering that like i would get depressed immediately after i get injured but now i, I i'm like Ooh, I wonder what my, you know, my therapist is going to like help me like unravel about this pain. Sure. And so reframe what it. else I'm going to have to do to adjust for it. Yeah, and exactly. New skill and, set as a result, right? It, yeah. And so it's, it's become a very interesting process of like just using what comes up as, as learning opportunities instead of like frustration. Yeah. I mean, you could, I, again, like, Part of, I think, the whole thing in life is that we're told that certain emotions are good and bad, you know, right. like anger is bad, good kids should not scream. And so we start to label certain emotions are just- We want to control behavior. That's the first thing we want to do. If something's out of our realm, right? I, I taught special ed, even self-contained classes uh, several decades ago and found that, you know, it was this- and teachers in general, I think, want to control kids in the classroom. And it's really a challenge to be able to just let go. And as you said, uh, you know, the mention of the word facilitate, mm -hmm. right? You're not there to control them. You're there to educate them. Well, yeah, what does educate mean? Understand these emotions, you know? And, and educate, the angry. Root word is you draw out. Yeah. Right. It's inside of you. Everything's inside of you. And as a parent, teacher, wise man, wise woman, it's to draw out. Right. You ask the questions to bring those that inner awareness that everyone has to the surface. Yeah. Now, do so you notice? Was, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, well, so we were saying that was the realm of just like in general, I think that people are afraid to look because the opening up Pandora's box is is your life's work. I really think that like to, to, um, uh, you know, I have a good friend that wrote a book called the courage circle and it's takes courage to be you right. And not to be others. And so like our life's mission is just to be ourselves, our right. most authentic selves. And then everything is about pushing us away from that. And so, you know, every, you know, the whole idea of the onion layer and just like, but to start that first layer is like the hardest for most people just to like, you know, go on. Otherwise you just live in this like automated way. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, that was it wrong. It seems to me that that core beingness is simply to love and be loved. Yep. Yep. Why do we avoid that? So 
you know, as you have, well, you have love and be loved and then live and let live uh, on your, your, your background over there. And I, I, I do find that that's been something for me. I understand now where my parents come from now with like, okay, they wanted, they saw life and they envisioned it for me. And so like, you know, I'm very into health and nutrition and like, like a holistic way of being. And so I want to like, you know, share my knowledge with other people, but a huge like lessons that have come along the way is, you know, uh, solicited versus unsolicited advice. Like hmm. I, I, I'm a wealth of knowledge and I want to share that with the people that are closest to me because I want to in, impact them in positive ways. But sometimes like it's not welcome or, or it's never welcome unless it's asked for. And so, you know, I kind of love my job because people come to me in pain and they're like, basically just like, teach me what you know. And so I'm like, yes, now I get to just like act right. out. They the give you permission. They give me permission. Exactly. And so, well, live and let live is also this thing of like seeing everyone around you and seeing how dysfunctional people are in general and not like trying to fix it. You know, that's yeah, like, just let them be who they are, you know, yeah, so, let thank them you be for who... bringing that up. You know, it, it's, it's exciting for me. I, uh, it's actually a global peace movement and there are two principles. So we call it a practical political philosophy. And, you know, politics, oh my God, what are you going to do? <laughs> so two principles, the moral and the legal. The moral is be an excellent human. And so we discuss what that really is. And, and we have groups and discussions and conversations and events and exercises around developing what that really is and sharing it with each other and helping each other aspire to be more, right? Because we all need that. And then the legal principle is don't aggress. And here's where the political effort comes in. Long term, we want to change the law to remove aggression of any kind. So that's going to take specific people with specific skills that are willing to step up and do the work. That I go again, you mentioned the 0.1%, right? So the majority though can agree on, <clears throat> hey, we need to treat each other better. So how do we do that? How can we learn to bridge the diversity gap, to bridge the cultural gaps, to bridge the philosophical and religious gaps, right? Because we accept anyone. It doesn't matter who you are, where you came from. You know, we just don't aggress, let people be who they are. If they want help, they ask for it, then you can offer it. That key question that you the statement you made about it, if they're not ready for it, and goes back to kind of the teenage years, right? If you're not asking the question, you're not seeking the answers. What seeking, what you're seeking is also seeking you. That's one thing that I found out. <clears throat> and there's bread scrubs everywhere when you're in that place. Yeah. yeah. However, if you're not asking the questions, it's not ridiculous, but nearly so in attempting to share your knowledge with others mm -hmm. because there's no listening there whatsoever. Yeah. So I think like a huge question to like ask would be like, if there's another way of thinking about this, like, would you be interested in learning more? Mm. And so someone has two answers to that. They'll say like, well, a couple answers. One would be like, yes, I am interested in learning more. Tell me. So now they've opened themselves up. Then there's the other options like, well, they could straight up and say no. And so it's like, why would you try to go into a conversation where like, if like if someone is saying outright, I am so closed-minded that if there's another way of thinking about something, I'm not willing to listen, mm -hmm. then don't try to go into that conversation. And right. then the final thing is like, well, this is probably where more, more people are. It's like, oh, I already know what you're going to say. So ho hold on. So like, you just, I just asked you a question. Like if, if there's another way of thinking about it, like I... Don't make an assumption about what I'm going to say. Like, seriously, do, would you like to hear what I'm going to say? Oh, oh okay, fine. Like, because mm -hmm. you almost have to double validate and ask them the question yeah. if they're re really willing to receive it. Because if they're coming up with a half guard, that's still a no. Like, you really have to, okay, fine. Yeah, yes, I am. Like, right. I have, you have my attention. And so, you know, with every political, like, thing going on in the world, people are fighting on the internet in funny ways where it's like, it's it's like the clothes versus the clothes and like no ever no battle was ever won over YouTube comments or Twitter or whatever it is. No. Like I don't and so it's just 
you know, obviously we're becoming extremely tribalistic and, you know, like uh, it's the and tribal polarized. and polarized and all that. And so, and yet many belief systems indicate that we're all one. Yep. Of right? course. So why don't we take that kind of view? If we are all one, then what might that look like? How might, might we behave? <laughs> we're all born that way. I think it just immediately, I, like, I like the adults will will then want to start to brainwash the child into thinking a certain way that these emotions are bad, that these people are bad, let's blame, you know, because it's instead of looking at thyself, it's like, all right, externalize the reason why your life is a certain way. And so it's, you know, uh, the oppressed Olympics going on right now with like people, yeah, just like, like, you, know, you know, believe and follow. Yeah. Don't do what we do, do what we say and believe and follow yeah. under threat. Right, and that came from you know millennia ago. When, uh, in my opinion, I think especially in the Christian realm, when Constantine canonized the Bible and put everything together to bridge church and state under threat of death if you did not follow. Mm -hmm. Right, and then that prescriptive methodology has softened over the years. It's still there. And we haven't really taken the time to analyze why and then resolve the cognitive dissonance, which is what I think it is internally, because we all know we're all relatives, right? This is one people, we have different varieties, right? But we're still one people, one planet. Yeah. That's the essence of it. And Maybe it, we're, we're just not quite to that place and the globalization is causing us to think about that and, and possibly even as a result from COVID and the pandemic or plandemic as, as some call it. I think there's a golden or a silver lining in it. Right? Sure. I, as long as, I mean, look, I, I, certainly people were affected by COVID in extremely different ways. For some people, it was an incredible time. For some people, it it put the stra it put a strain on everything, and so certainly if you were in like if your health wasn't great, like you were more exposed, you were more fear based. Mm -hmm. Other times, people had to finally had a chance to pause and reflect on their life and look at what mattered to them. Unfortunately, I think because like somehow the the nature of life going back to normal so quickly type thing, people like could very quickly fall back into their old patterns and beings. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I really think it depended on the individual and some people, like, it was a great time and some people obviously were very affected by it in different ways, so. Right, and it gave people, especially in the workforce arena, it gave people permission to say, hey, I'm not satisfied with this. I, I'm Yeah, save time on commuting, look at their jobs and see if they actually like it, you know? I mean, we should be always asking these questions. What do I want and what do I need as we, we what well, I Again, about. we get caught in the safety and security trap. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is familiar, it's okay, enough, you know, good mm -hmm. enough, I think. Um, even that statement, like it was something that I learned about like, you know, I have people in my life where I like that their MO of life is good enough. And I get triggered by that because I'm like always seeking improvement. Um, but then it's like also to realize that, well, why do I get triggered? Like, let's look at why am I triggered by th these things? It's because I often don't give myself permission to be just good enough in certain circumstances. Like just chill and not everything always has to be yeah. better all the time so we can get well, in the, the perfection this attitude is okay to a certain extent but i don't think i'm saying a perfectionist attitude but more about a, a mindset of like always wanting to improve and sometimes it's okay to just like not and just exist and be um yeah, be okay with who you are yeah, love yeah, yeah. what you are where you are who you and are yeah and the journey you're on you know if you want to grow there'll be opportunity to that yeah uh, Renee Maria Rilke, um, a really well beloved writer, you know, an explorer, philosopher, uh, says, you know, ask the question, you got to live with it. You can't answer it in the moment because you don't have the information to do so. Life has to respond to that question. So you need to have the patience with it and live your life because the experience that you have will answer the question. Because there's so many dynamics, especially with pertinent questions, right? Yeah. 
it just takes a while for that information to flow through. And, and it does. Listen. That's yeah. the really wonderful thing, right? When you can sit back and have you noticed this, that when you ask the question and you can sit in reflection, your life takes on a different um, atmosphere, I guess. Yeah. Like, yeah, I guess like sometimes at the end of these sessions that I would have this with, with this therapist guy, I'd be like, all right, well, like I, I want like initially the way that I would view it is like, I need it. Like something needs to be checked off. But now I realize more so it's like, all right, we just had this deep conversation. Like we revealed this, you know, something under a pile that I didn't, wasn't aware of. And now, okay, kind of sit back and like let things unfold. So before it was now like- that's an apocalypse, right? Yeah. This is why, the, one of the reasons why I call these apocalyptic chats. Because apocalypse means revealing, uh -huh. unveiling, uncovering. Yeah. yeah. Right, so you have your own personal revelation, revel revelation as a result. Easy yeah. for me to say, right? So, in those revelations that you have, what did you find was that the key one, right? That began this. Oh, I really have another way to look at things. Well, I, I, I think a huge element of uh, I, we uh, I kind of discussed already because like a couple big moments in my life were like I literally I told my parents we were like you know they would have done anything for me to get into med school like my dad was like so gung ho because like at almost like, it's a identity representation for him this yeah. vicarious living and so at one point you know they were like helping me they got someone to edit my med school essays and stuff and I was like I was but I was still dealing with all my pain and we were in, I'm in Montreal but we were in Toronto. And like, I, I, I went up to them and the first time I said to them, like, I want to go into physiotherapy. And they both, they both looked at me and they just said, no. And I said, what do you mean? No. And I just ran away crying. Mm. And so, like, that was like a moment, like, I, I, I'm not getting dictated anymore. I'm telling you my inner truth. And like, that's, what's going to happen. So there was deep moments and like coming back around to it and like, you know, even though that my mom's a physio, we practice differently. She's in the old school mentality of like, all right, body sight of pain equals sight of problem. Whereas I'm looking right. and like I'm super analytical about someone's knee pains related to the way the foot loads, the hip loads. Like, you know, you again, take like, a more holistic view, yeah, like than the focused one, I guess, or myopic. Yeah, exactly. So it's like you know, where like tunnel vision and just start like treating the the symptoms rather than looking more holistically. Yeah. At mm -hmm. the body and like fortunately i've met the right mentors who facilitated and allowed me to see the body in this way and so i'm i see people with years and years of chronic pain and i get them better within weeks or months after they've been around the house and have claimed to have tried everything so i knew that like this was what i wanted to do and so like i wasn't like what do you mean no okay well now we're at an impasse here and so <laughs> yeah that's um, not so no, what do you mean? Along no. the way, they they've come around, and that was like back in 2016. But I still think a lot of it is just like I'm finally starting to have a, an acceptance of like non-proving and performance, and like that being the the measure of my life, and just like um, being satisfied with well, not just now, but it's been a you know a journey. Yeah. Of and how do you measure the milestones in one's life, right? <clears throat> it's a personal recognition and, and yeah. the outer world is going to reflect it differently. Now, speaking of the outer world and in, in your, in your um, work, you focus on specific areas. Now, you mentioned the, the various layers, right? As you're able to look at a holistic picture, mm -hmm. and the layers within those, even as from a physiotherapy standpoint, how did you see that reflected in the world at large for um, yourself and, and your own yeah well i guess it's outside it's like, of your practice i mean it, let's go in the world of like the body obviously it's like medicine and physio are both about the site rather than like how that site interacts with the whole system so mm -hmm. medicine is, you know, we talked about this, is very pharmacologically based. And like, there's this whole idea of like functional medicine appearing in the corners on the out, but again, called alternative where it's like, all right, they're looking at stool tests and they're looking at, 
mold and they're looking at nutrition and they're looking at like providing the body with the assumption that if you give it the nutrients it needs, it could heal itself. Whereas like we treat the body as stupid and like more so a, a, just address the symptom rather than, than recognizing like the beauty of how uh, how the body has the innate capacity to heal itself and it has this intelligence of interacting in like Eastern and Western medicine and, and not. Yeah, is this a past life issue? Is it a current issue? Right. Cause there yeah, are like, we, things we, that we interact as well. View, like these concepts of the woo woo by like, but again, that's like, you know, they, they talk about the idea that medicine evolves one funeral at a time, which is a, just a sad way of just saying like, you know, the, the dominant figures, these ma like male figures most of the time like that have dominated the way that medicine is practiced you're too you know the agreeableness and all of us look up to those people who have set the tone but you can't question them and so if you can't question them so that's like we have to wait until they they, they leave the space to start looking at it but at that point it's almost too late because you take a lot of smart people and you train them in a th way of thinking that's extremely reductionist. And so now we have a million specialists in the field of medicine mm -hmm. instead of like, like, it, it, you know, my wife's in medical school and when people, when she says she wants to be a general practitioner, that's looked down upon. Like being a family physician is not like as sexy as being a specialized right. in one sense well that's well, the reason i started pre-med as a teenager my <laughs> uncle was a gp he was our town doctor i yeah. loved how he could deal with people he was always jovial uh, even in serious situations he knew how to navigate through them he was a phenomenal diagnostician and was just really intuitive uh, in the way he managed things and and so we don't have that today. And I agree with you with that we've gotten so specialized and so intimate with the symptoms mm -hmm. that, and maybe this is just part of a process, right? Where we, we dive really as far deep into it as possible and realize, oh, we've got to begin again because this is not making sense anymore. And those like you and, and you know, the alternative therapists and, and uh, practitioners now are saying, okay, now let's look at the bigger picture. Let's start with the internal self first and then see how it's operating in respect to what's going on around it, as well as how it sees itself. And that yeah. seems to be a, a critical factor that we're needing to face uh, on a large scale. Yeah, sure. I just wonder sure. when, you know, because obviously the health crisis in the States and like globally, you know, the more westernized the world becomes, you see like rising rates of obesity, even places like India, because they're starting to like model the way that like American lives are living. Oh, yeah. Burgers like, and fries, right? And fast yeah, food in general. Yeah. So it's, you know, I, I, I still see. Are there any slow food drive-ins? I don't know, but. I think, you know, places like Italy are, 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 you feel it differently when you go to a place like Italy and like, it's just such a wonderful place in my mind because every place you go to is mom and pop shops, mm -hmm. like whether it's at a B and B or the restaurants, the food and is it more seems as much a slower pace too. So much slower pace. Like, that's why I always say like, you know, the, my, my mornings on vacation are like the best because like, you wake up, you have a cappuccino, you're like, we, we stayed at like a. Uh, for my honeymoon last year, I stayed at like uh, just a B and B where it was like there was an orange, or the thank you, thank you. So there was an orange and lemon tree orchard farm where we stayed, and it was the grandpa showing us like the chickens and the eggs and where things come from. And so like you're just way more connected to the source rather than just like all right, where does our food come from? People don't question that. Like we often you know start to again specialize and not like eat the whole animal for example and so there's just many systems that are just very dysfunctional and it ultimately just often comes back to like more ancestral health instead of like more technology the, the fascinating thing about technology is it could bring you, know, you and i together to have a conversation but then like when we get in the room together the technology goes away so to say the problem is that now when we're all like you know 
we can all be together, but not together at the same time. And like, that's what you, you find in so many places. Right. Like, right. Well, you walk into a restaurant or down a mall and they've got a, they've got a table that's got, you know, 12, 15 people at it and they're all on their phones. Yeah. It's not scary talking. and it's, it's normalized again. That's the thing, right? you know? And so uh, I have a feeling, you know, like any process, we, we look at things at a very short timeline. For sure. Right. Yeah. right. When you pull back and you can see and you can look at process and trends and, and um, curves, if you will, or cycles, it takes on a much different view. And you can seem to anyway step into facilitating uh, at least small rises. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There, that's who, it, who it, I it, get attracted to in that sense of like, who are my friends and close people in my life? Those that are like prioritizing nature, deeper connection. I'm not the one that is at a house party throughout my life talking to 12 different people. It's like, all right, and I end up getting into like one, two hour conversation with someone in the corner of the room. And so like, that's always been my vibration has been like depth ver versus like just quantity of, of, of connections, you know? Right. You, you like the, the in-depth as opposed to the cursory. And, and I'm with you on that one. I, I'm, it's really difficult for me to have cursory conversations at this point in my life. Yeah. Just not interested. Yep. Um, and I think the sooner we realize that, like, then you, like, that's just like the point of life is to have that feedback loop, loop be like way faster. So instead of it happening when you're 60 or you can, it, it can happen a lot sooner in your life, but we're often, you know, trying, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a process obviously, but it's because of the, the people pleasing in all of us. Well, this is what I hope to achieve with the show, right? It's having conversations with folks like you, young and old alike, and to be able to bring these kinds of, um, points of order, awareness, you know, how we seek our own truths and find them. It gives, I'm hoping, the younger generation an opportunity to see and witness and take in what, you know, if they are asking questions, to maybe yeah. get some answers, but not necessarily forcing them down their throat. That's no, never a way to do things. However, with opportunity, with seeking, when you're looking for things, have you ever noticed how when you are seeking something that those breadcrumbs begin to pop up and, and you're led to something in ways that you would have never imagined? 100%, yeah. Is there something in that vein that you could share that would have a real rock solid, you know, uh, example of that yeah um i mean it's a just an extremely recent uh phenomenon that um so again my father's an emergency doctor obviously he can for the last 35 40 years and so he could conduct Ooh, himself tough. yeah but this is you know this is like who he is and he he's been able to do that his whole life but interestingly the moment that i get injured what happened what happened? Like he freaks out. And so, <laughs> well, yeah, it's his son, right? You know, but, it, but not in a composed way, in an over-exaggerated way, which you wouldn't expect for someone who can conduct himself when someone's having a heart attack, when there's like, whatever it might be, trauma, gunshot wound, like, but an over-exaggerated. Well, not He's not attached to them. So he just goes with the skill set and what needs sure. to be the moment. Yes. So like me, trying to understand like certain relationships with him specifically. Um, so this happened over the weekend where um, he thought I was putting my hand in the sink into the garburetor. And so he, he like, I've never seen him move so fast. Like get up. I'm like, I just look at him like, Tam toi, like uh, just relax. Like, I don't understand. Like one, like how, <laughs> how do you think I'm that stupid to put my hand? I am 30 years old. I know what a garburetor is. Right. He, he flipped out in that moment. But why I mention that is because, you know, part of when I was, when I was like a very young kid, I don't know if you could say I have a little scar on my eyebrow here. Okay. And what happened was my dad had me in his lap and he was bouncing me and 
he, the phone rang and I kept bouncing myself and he wasn't holding on to me. And I ended up hitting the corner of a table and, um, whatever, sl sloshing this and needing to get some glue or whatever. But in that moment, he freaked out, obviously. Sure. And my mom was there to calm him down, which is funny because my dad is the, the should be the, right. you know, right. <laughs> but in that moment in time, again, this was just a recent, like understanding, like my inner child was seeking out like action for my dad and not my mom, because the way that my relationship works with them is that like, my mom is certainly more emotionally available than my dad. And my dad had a, you know, very stern and my last name is stern, like very stern father who was the you know, classic older generation that didn't show emotions and those are weak. Um, but at that moment I needed like my father, not my mom. And that's kind of been a pattern in my life as I'm seeing it now. Like, you know, my mom is always the one, like it's almost an intermediary between me and my dad to like, I have something to say. It's like, I say my mom and then my mom like almost translates it to him. So like where the bread breadcrumb arise here is understand that like, if clearly, so like, you know, I've been injured so many times in my life, but why am I getting injured all the time? Well, if my inner being only feels my father's love in my mind, in my perspective, when I'm in danger or when I get hurt, let's get hurt a lot to make sure that I, I, I actually feel my dad's love. And so I have been hurt so many times in my life. I've had like 10 broken bones, 35, 40 stitches, just trauma after trauma after trauma. And all that is like seeking out this, this idea while well, like, I don't have to, well, he asked me a question like, does it make sense to you? Or do you need to get hurt anymore for your father to love you? And it's like, well, obviously the answer is no, mm -hmm. but like until like you could bring that to the surface and understand that, then, you know, the very deep realization that like, well, yeah, that's a deep psychological pattern that most of us are, even when we hear it are like, nah, yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. You and know. yet, it's those subtle things. It's how we think and feel that we well, it's the baby, use right? that our reality from. We, it's our awareness. We, we need to feel love, like as we said, right, as the, the inner child. And so it's like these right. neurosations get paired. And unless we could have an awareness of that, well, you know, that's why it's like I, I'm, I'm observing so much patterns of children around me. Instagram thinks I'm like a parent now all of a sudden they're feeding me like the algorithms of like conscious yeah. parenting and stuff, even though I'm not a parent, but well, they're prepping you. Yeah. They know you got married. So now it's like, okay, next step, you're going to have a kid. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know, I guess, but it's interesting because I think that if we look at psychology of how we should parent, it's how should we should behave with other people? Because ultimately it's like you're, you, you let people express their emotions and you don't label things as good or bad and you validate people's what they're feeling. Don't them. Let them have their own life. Okay. Be the there when space. they ask for help. Guide yeah. them, you know, keep them out of extreme danger, of course. However. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, that, that, that was a pretty deep. Uh, That's awesome. Yeah. I, I really appreciate that. And I, I'm sure that there is some learning there for our audience as well, or at least some serious things to question. Right? Yeah. I think, like, we need to look at our young childhood experiences and well, uh, like either you had like quote unquote like and again this is not my language but capital T trauma like big sexual abuse rape thing like that or you just had a, a normal childhood but beyond that normal childhood there's these places where oh there's a whole of, uh, yeah and it's not like anything ever malicious it's just their your parents own parenting that shapes how they parent you and sometimes they'll deny your reality oh that's okay like i'm sure when you got like denied a, a like a spot at the table that that's like you know they didn't mean it or whatever but it's like just validate that hurt child's experience Absolutely. or whatever it might be embrace you know, you know it's the, this what i meant to say one of the things that came up earlier that i missed uh, relating to is that to embrace all of our emotions. Do not deny any of them yeah. because that's yeah. what causes dis-ease. You need yes. to be able to acknowledge them for yes. yourself. And it doesn't, 
others that are there in kindred spirit will see that and they will acknowledge your own knowledge your truth yes right it's where when you present in your own authentic honest open vulnerable way and then others say no that's not true right it's like somebody telling you what you feel like yeah it's like no i'm trying to tell you what you feel like yeah exactly listen. so that that if that happens in childhood well then you start to like not trust yourself and right. start putting your emotions in other people and so that's a uh you know a massive massive thing so um that process is that developed yeah. we're totally unaware of as they're happening yes yeah so yeah. as i see like you know cousins and and like you know brother-in-laws have kids i'm like i just like observe how they're behaving and it's like it's not my place to to like tell them how to parent but i'm just like uh, like uh. what's well, a gut feeling you're gonna know yeah. Yeah. when things are are in flow and they're working because you're gonna sense it there's not going to be any disturbance mm -hmm emotionally mm -hmm. internally yeah we're kind of coming up on, on our time uh, together and i really uh, appreciate the the depth of your inner wisdom and your outer experience at, at such a young age it, it's rare that um, in my experience so i really appreciate you being able to share that as a parting gift if you will can you offer something that really you feel would be an important um simple step or a, even a first step to take to become more aware uh, to further align with with yourself in the mind body spirit yeah so this is going to go back to my physio realm of world um one of the first understandings i had which seems very obvious but again the most obvious truths are sometimes the most important is that when i was dealing with my foot pain for so long i was given orthotics and orthopedic shoes right and so what the the, the notion is don't let the foot move and you'll be out of pain that's the equivalent logic as if you got into let's say a car accident and you were in a neck brace right now let's keep that neck brace on you for the rest of your life does that make sense mm -mm. No. So when it comes down to um, foot health and why I'm talking about this, because this actually has to do with like becoming more connected to you, is this concept of going to what's called natural footwear. So I'll just show you a little thing here. So shoes that are much wider at the tips of the toes, super flat, completely flexible. Now, this goes against everyone's notion of what a good shoe is. When we hear a good shoe, we think arch support, motion control, rigid, stable. But our feet, feet aren't built that way. Our feet are not built that way. And so for hundreds of thousands of years, we walked bare from this planet. And I swear, so when I, so I, over time, I ended up transitioning and getting my feet moving in a way where I could walk in this no problem after not, again, like being able to stand barefoot for more than a few seconds. And so that transition brought me to like these, these more interesting shoes where as you're walking, you're just so much more aware of your movement because you could feel the ground. Mm -hmm. Your feet and your eyes are a sensor, right? So your eyes are meant to see. And so you don't put a blindfold on your eyes. You put sunglasses if it's too sunny. And so when we do decide that we need to wear shoes in our society, we want to still be able to perceive the ground and feel the stones and feel the rocks and be able to connect to the ground, especially when you're walking in nature. It's so much nicer or even going barefoot at that point. Mm -hmm. So funny enough, I was in Miami very recently for some sort of networking event. And I saw someone wearing these shoes that was part of the event. Me and him immediately connected and we like got super deep. And I truly believe it's like anyone that's wearing these shoes, it's like they get it. They've already started to question the natural assumptions that we all make about something as simple as shoes. So mm -hmm. a, a huge thing is like starting on your journey. It's not like physical journey, emotional journey, and they're separate. It's this intertwined thing that happens that the moment that you start like going more, you know, bare feet, you start to become more connected to your body. And then you start questioning other things about your life. And oh, so but I, it's not fashionable. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I lost my ego long ago when I was like, all right, I'm in chronic pain in my feet. I want to be out of pain and now I'm out of pain. And so like, I only wear these types of shoes that are super flexible. 
And, you know, there's boots available. Montreal's getting pretty cold right now. I have winter boots that are exact same thing, super flexible. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's a, it's a, it's a way of opening up the box from, from the physical that leads into all sorts of other realms of life. I think would be interesting for people to, uh, to explore. So if they look up natural footwear or minimalist footwear, and there's tons of brand, brands that are available that, you know, don't squish your toes and atrophy your feet and make them all stiff because they just let your feet be. They protect the feet, but they don't impose on the feet. Right. Well, and, you know, tasty, again, like... Tasty tidbit that I wouldn't have expected, but that sounds yeah, really yeah. Well, cool. again, remember the idea, my, my, the name of the company is called From the Ground Up Physiotherapy. So it's all about how our feet impact the rest of our body. And so we can't consider a knee or a hip or a back pain without considering our feet. Sure. Naturally, you know, it's the foundation of our body. Well, gosh, that just kind of makes sense now, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> it's been just a phenomenal uh, conversation. I, I really love where we went with it. And, and your ability to share uh, from a deep space and, and vulnerably. And I appreciate that. And I'm sure our audience will, too. Thank you very much. It for speaks having well you. of your practice there as well. So thank you again. Thanks. And namaste and in la catch. And thanks for sticking with us for this episode of One World in a New World. I'm Zen Benefiel, your host, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>